All right, so now for the Green War part of MacArthur's life. Basically, this is from 1942 to 44. This is basically after he's already kind of retreated to Australia and is now kind of making the biggest, we'll say counteroffensive for the Pacific Theater, where he's actually starting to, to you know, like, I don't wanna say, it. it's not that he's just now starting to push back against the Japanese, it's that he's finally able to like actually gain ground, if that makes sense. Um, so there's that. With that being said, um, it's worth talking about kind of the grand scheme of things for the Pacific Theater and just like how big it was. So to take a quote from the book, so Charles Willoughby has called the Pacific conflict the war of distances. Its magnitude may be conveyed in many ways. Uh, MacArthur, for example, was feverishly preparing to defend an area as large as the United States with a coastline just as long, about 12,000 miles. Put another way, in Melbourne, he was like a foreign general arriving in New Orleans and facing the need to repulse enemy offenses expected at any moment all along the U.S.-Canadian border. In a third comparison, his theater of operations was 25 times as large as Texas, while traveling from Bachelor Field to the Menzies Hotel, he had tra traversed approximately the same distance as a Canadian journey journeying from Winnipeg to Miami. Overall, his coming campaigns would cover mileage equivalent to that of the Engl from the English Channel to the Persian Gulf, twice the farthest conquests of Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon. So just kind of giving a little bit of context of just like how much distance there was period in the, all of the Pacific theater because it's in, in the ocean a bunch of islands and stuff <laughs> um to continue so it would make sense then as soon as he kind of first got to his headquarters in Melbourne once he was in Australia um to say you know during the weeks after his arrival in Melbourne he spent long evenings in the map room I mean with that much distance to cover you kind of have to um, he, his first duty was to safeguard Australia, so he began by mastering the intricacies of the continent's 2,900-mile eastern coastline, which lay naked to invasion all spring. Um, however, now, uh, MacArthur now had tre tremendous respect for the foe, the Japanese. Um, he said, they are the greatest exploiters of inefficient and incompetent troops the world has ever seen. So... Or is that which especially getting thrown basically after this is coming from a general who was pretty much I don't want to say resigned himself that's not like the best way to say it because it's not like that kind of gives the con connotation that he's kind of just like laying down um, and taking it in a way but basically was willing to spend his you know to die on Corregidor and um, Baton with his troops and stuff as they got stuck um and on the previous video i talked about that and the thumbnail has a nice map of everything and all that kind of stuff so give a little context on the greater things and the reason why he was kind of just he was put in this precarious uh position in terms of like as a theater commander in the pacific so coming from roosevelt um roosevelt would have said would have had the final say in, in so major a wow I can't talk this morning anyways uh, basically if there was a major strategic shift basically where they put more emphasis on uh, the Pacific than they had up to this point it'd be up to FDR um, however there was never any doubt that he intended to abide by Rainbow 5 which was basically the plan to complete the the conflict in Europe before uh, turning westward to Japan, right? Kind of talked about that a bit in previous videos, too. That's just the name of the plan they had. So on May 6th, he had written MacArthur that he would, under, while he understood the general's frustration, marshalling armies powerful enough to open a second front in Europe must come first. The president added, I know that you will feel the effect of all this. I, I well realize that your difficult problems and that you have to be an ambassador as well as a supreme commander. Because especially like being in Australia, there was a lot of morale issues and so on 
um, where they literally like a high rank, like as a quote here, a high, as a high ranking Australian officer uh, told Clark Lee, Australia, like the Philippines, is expendable in terms of global strategy. So especially in the beginning of the war, that whole kind of theater felt like, you know, they didn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. They were kind of just, you know, meant to sit there and take it during this time. But pretty much. And a lot of this one, like I, I've been talking about, um, the purpose of these videos aren't necessarily to go like obnoxiously in depth as of right now. Um, but definitely like if you guys want me to go more in depth on very specific things um i'm kind of just breaking apart little time periods in his life so like for this one it was like a lot of it was taking back uh papua new guinea uh you got the battle of port moresby um that sort of thing and then there was another one uh another big one in my head uh mostly dealing with the we'll call the infamous Owen Stanley range, like the actual mountains and stuff in Papua New Guinea, um, and so on. So there's that. And we start to see some, I guess the beginnings of some plans that MacArthur has used in, that, will, that he will use in the future that are more kind of mainstream. Specifically what I'm talking about is Incheon and the Korean War, which we'll talk about later in the book. But he kind of starts to use similar, uh, we'll say ideas, um, at this time as well. So, as you could probably guess, um, when, especially when he's taking back, uh, Papua New Guinea, which is like, I think it's the biggest island, or it is the biggest island, um, in the Philippines and so on, or there's something else significant about it that's eluding me right now. But anyways, uh, so he was given a very, um, we'll say broad mandate, on how to basically act in this whole theater. Um, to say specifically, so the general had been given the broadest possible mandate and the only quadrant qualifications, sanctioning operations in New Guinea subsequent to the Waywak Kavieg, Kavieg, Eng? I don't know how to pronounce it, but that operation um, basically um, he draws an analogy basically being like, you know, this is similar to instructing Eisenhower to proceed basically to go from Normandy to Prague and pretty much as soon as possible and leaving the details completely up to him, you know, basically like, you know, I want you to do this and have fun. Here's a, a massive undertaking and do your do your best sort of thing but that's also kind of the thing that it seems like MacArthur would sort of you know thrive under like that's kind of his preference especially with how he acts uh, later on at the uh basically being not the president but basically being in charge of reconstructing the government of Japan later on which we'll get into and there's that, and then there's also his uh, his actions in Korea as well. So, to continue, his Japanese adversary in Manila, General Hisashi Tera, Terauchi, interpreted uh, these to mean that MacArthur intended to edge ahead, fighting for village after village. He had something much grander in mind, a tremendous... 400 mile leap to Hollandia over two, 200 miles behind the enemy supply depots. So this is like, we really start to see where, kind of like how he did in Inchon, where he pretty much like skipped um, a lot of enemy uh, territory to go to a very kind of soft spot behind that they weren't very, uh, they weren't defending pretty well. And they um, did not expect to see him there. So this is kind of the first time we start to see that. Um, it was also very, um, his advisors were pretty heavily against, which we'll say a bit later too. So to, con to, to continue on, the Hollandia lunge 
would have been beyond the talents of all but a few of history's great captains. In retrospect, it looms as a military classic comparable to Hannibal's maneuvering at Canet and Napoleon's at uh, Austerlitz. Uh, it is, of course, less famous. That may be attributed to a curious principle. This was one part that kind of made me think a little bit too. So uh, maybe to, that may be attributed to a curious principle which seems to guide those who write of Titanic battles. The higher the casualty list, it appears, the vaster the investment in blood, the greater the need to justify them. Thus, the dead are honored by hallowing the names of the places where they fell. Thus, writers enshrine in memory the Verdans, the Passendales, the Tarwas, and the Dunkirks, while neglecting device, divisive, wow, decisive struggles in which the loss of life was small. And this is one thing that it starts to get into, like how, I won't say clean, but there was a big discrepancy between, you know, especially the casualty list between what MacArthur was doing and what like the Admiralties were doing. Um, Cause the Pacific theater was split between, you know, like basically run by MacArthur at first, right? Um, at first it was split between MacArthur who was more like kind of down South, like we're talking about with Port, um, with New Guinea, so on, and the land stuff. And then you had kind of the Eastern part of everything, which was more by Admiral Nimitz in the Navy and so on. And those are your like Okinawa, Guadalcanal and so on to where like there was a massive casualty list um, with the Marines and stuff. And it was basically, as he described, the author describes here, um, is pretty, I don't wanna say it's up to style um, but pretty much just the way of fighting MacArthur was not very um, liberal in, I don't want to say risking the lives of his men because it's war. That's the whole thing. Um, but he was, I mean, he just did it in such a way that there didn't need to be massive casualties, like relatively comparing it to um at least what at the how Admiral Nimitz was fighting and so on. Um, so there's that, and finally, uh, so pretty much this whole Hol Hollandia thing. So MacArthur, to take a quote, um, MacArthur against the majority of the advice decided at our landings would have to be made at Hollandia. We landed at Hollandia, a rather empty but well upholstered upho rear headquarters. And in a week or two, we were well established with a strong perimeter and the Japanese whom we had passed at WeWork had to work their very slow and murderous way through our great ally, the jungle, to attack us many weeks later, sick and demoralized through dysentery, starvation, and malaria. And that's one thing it really kind of goes into um, in this section and especially calling it the Green War was there was a... It's, Every island was a jungle, um, a lot of it mountainous, just like we talked about, like the mountain ranges of Papua New Guinea. It's basically like a massive spine, um, is how it's described sometimes. But, like I said, it's massive. Um, so you had to see, they had to secure all or a large part of New Guinea. Um, and it was a landmass of 1,400 or 1,500 miles from one end to the other. And basically, like, there could be no air cover because of how it was, sort of thing. But, so there's this, kind of a little bit of Papua New Guinea and so on in Hollandia. Might go a little bit more in depth than that in the future. But this is also where um, there was kind of a, MacArthur had himself built a rather controversial home. Um, basically since they kind of used this as a new fob in a way forward operating base they uh he had a pretty decent sized home compared to everyone else um built at this time and there was some controversy we'll say with how that was played up but anyways since this one's going at about 15 minutes we'll start we'll wrap it up um like i've been saying um 
this this series of videos is mostly coming from a book called American Caesar um, by William Manchester. It's one of his biographers. Here's a cover if you want to see it. So there's that. Um, this isn't this whole playlist is meant to be kind of like a working kind of like a working paper in a way where I'm kind of just putting the stuff that I find um, to look more in depth on and so on and different sources to be used as well. It's not going to just be this book, but plan on finding other ones and kind of throwing them in there as I go. Also kind of starting to look through like the National Archives and that sort of thing to see what I can find, kind of share that as well. But regardless, that's where this information is coming from with the quotes and such. Um, if you guys want me to go more in depth on specific things, just let me know in the comments and so on. Um, that's what they're there for. But yeah, with that being said, uh, we'll kind of finish out the um, Pacific Theater in World War II um, in the next video. And hope to see you guys on one of those.